Good morning, everyone, here in the room and on the live stream, and welcome to this press conference on the future of health as a global challenge. If you're joining this press conference at the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum 2016, which you might have uh, taken the hint from the subtle branding in our back. Um, the forum uh, is very excited about this press conference because um, we're launching today the global challenge, Future of Health. So far, the forum had nine global challenges, so areas where we believe that public-private cooperation can produce uh, um, beneficial results. And we're adding today and officially launching here today the 10th global challenge, the future uh, of health. And uh, I'm joined today by a fantastic uh, panel. Um, I'll start with the introductions right from, from the end of, uh, of the panel. Uh, we're joined by Mark uh, Zussman, who's the president uh, for global policy advocacy and country programs at the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you for joining us. Right next to him, we have Omar Ash uh, Ishraq, the chairman and chief executive officer of Medtronic. Right in the middle, we have Franz van Houten, who's the CEO and chairman of Royal Philips. And next to him, we have uh, Arif Nakvi, the founder and group chief, chief executive of the Abrash Group based in the United Arab Emirates. And last, last but definitely not least, uh, we're joined by my colleague Arnaud Bernard, who is the head of global health and healthcare industries at the World Economic Forum, who will also be responsible for this uh, global challenge at the World Economic Forum. And without further ado, Arnaud, uh, tell us what is this global challenge about? Why is the forum active in the field of health? Yes, uh, thank you, Georg. Uh, so uh, about the challenge, which uh, uh, we will be launching officially, we will launching officially today, and, uh, and, and in effect, in practice, with our potential global challenge partners and potential trustees on Friday at 1 o'clock. About the challenge, uh, this is a recognition that as much as we have a very, very strong healthcare industry community, we think that the healthcare industry community in public-private partnerships, in collaboration with the public sector and the civil society, has to focus on access to care and value-based healthcare. So meaning that when we talk about the seven trillion of healthcare spending globally, of which we think 30% is being wasted for outcomes that are, in a way, insufficient, this is where our healthcare industries need to work very closely with policymakers to create the incentives to make better delivery of care, care delivery, health care. Now, what about health? That's some things that we want to address as a complement to our industry program, and that's where we create this additional community of partners and trustees, because we believe the health challenge can be addressed only as a cross-sector initiative way beyond the healthcare sector. Think about healthy uh, nutrients, think about mobility, think about exercise, think about designing cities that are prone to aging gracefully at home. That's all the areas that the global challenge will, will address. That's talking about keeping individually, individuals healthy in the first place so that they don't have to actually utilize those highly expensive healthcare systems. That's all about health, health at the level of the individual, health uh, as a way to actually enjoy healthy lifestyles and, and age gracefully, and also health at the level of populations, always in the field of prevention. Again, think about the pandemics, think about the resistance to antibiotics, think about everything we have seen and we have learned from the Ebola crisis. Those populations are currently exposed to major global health security risks. And that's also an area that's going to be covered as part of the global challenge. So in summary, Georg, you know, we have seen decades of improvement in healthcare, and we have seen decades of improvement in, uh, in the way populations are uh, seeing longevity increase. Now, but now we are, at, we are almost at a turning point where all this progress is at risk of being uh, of, 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 of being destroyed in a way, all this progress is at risk because of non-communicable diseases, because of 34 million uh, people dying annually from non-communicable diseases. Many of them could have been saved with healthy lifestyles. We'll see, uh, we'll see re-emergence of some diseases, polio being one of them. We'll see risks of pandemics, and we see also the role of the World Economic Forum 
as a catalyst to pu pu public-private partnership uh, as an instrument to actually make sure that populations can stay healthy in the first place. And we have proof points. This is not new. We have done that in the past. I mean, think when Gavi was formed in 2001. Think when the, actually the Global Fund was presented in Davos in 2002. Those are the type of things we want to do again with partners as we connect with the policymakers, and we'll talk a lot about that in the next few days. Thank you, Arnaud. Uh, Arif, from, uh, from a non-expert's perspective, you're probably the most surprising candidate on this panel because the Abraj Fund is not one of the usual suspects, but you're still uh, very involved in the, in, the, in the global challenge. So tell us, how can private capital contribute to solving and to, to countering this, uh, this global health challenge? Uh, thank you. Well, I, you know, I'm very proud that I'm on this panel and having this conversation because contrary to what you may think, the Abraj Group actually is very involved in healthcare and has been since inception. So um, we've invested over a billion dollars in close to 30 companies across the last 10 years in this sector, all the while learning and all the while understanding what it takes to make healthcare efficient and healthcare uh, accessible and affordable uh, to the vast band of humanity that occupies what a lot of people call the emerging markets, we call the global growth markets, because these are the markets where the world is going to experience significant economic growth in the decades to come. Two-thirds of global consumption is going to come from there. Two-thirds of the middle classes uh, reside there. And urbanization, which is a big trend across the world, is actually more prevalent in those markets than anywhere else. But if that is going to be realized, if that promise is going to be realized, then one of the most critical things that we have to address is the lack of high quality health care, which in effect is actually a deterrent to all of that growth as well. So when we looked at um, the opportunity that private capital can play in pulling together a very effective response to what often is a failing on the part of governments across those markets, what we realized is that private equity, which traditionally has not been known um, to invest in longer term and longer gestation, uh, projects, we decided to look at uh, adaptation of the model, what I like to call private equity 3.0. And that is, um, if you like, a very strong emphasis on partnership capital, on alliances. And what do I mean by that? So obviously there's a dual purpose. The first is to make money for investors and to provide a return on capital. But equally importantly, when we refer to partnership capital, what I'm talking about is the people on uh, this panel and people around the world that have different elements to contribute to uh, helping making healthcare a sustainable and a viable option available to more and more people. And so the Abraj Group has worked very hard over the years to pull together these alliances, to pull together, uh, for example, our Global Healthcare Fund, in which you know the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Philips, Medtronics are key value-add partners and um, each of us has a role to play in the development of uh, having affordable health care available to our, um, to our marketplace. But equally importantly, the capital that we deploy is then used to build alliances. In other words, if we were to invest as we just have, uh, all of us collectively, into India's fifth largest uh, hospital uh, business, which is called CARE, which operates in second and third tier cities across India. And there you have a cadre of doctors and healthcare technicians that are actually world class. And if we can use that expertise and that training and apply it across Africa, everybody is a winner. If we can apply learnings in one area into another, everybody is a winner. So this alliance-based approach is actually going to work very effectively in healthcare. And we hope that all of us have a role to play in making more and more people aware of that. Thank you very much, Arif. Uh, Franz, the theme of the, of the annual meeting this year is the fourth industrial revolution, and, and it definitely affects uh, uh, the, the health sector as well. Philips is at the forefront at, at looking uh, uh, what is happening there. If the individuals take more control of their health through technology, how will it affect, the, how will it affect your sector? Yeah, that's uh, uh, indeed a trend and very important. So uh, let me expand a little bit and then come back to your point. Um, if we look at uh, the world um, with growing population, an aging population, a world with more chronic disease, uh, where actually healthcare is already close to nine trillion US dollars, 
and even so not everybody has access and not all those dollars are well spent uh, and have the right outcomes um, and much of that spend is in fact um, targeted towards uh, acute and episodic care and if you are a little bit blunt then it means it's it's reactive it waits until a patient is truly sick um, and therefore we are in a crisis as, as, as a health industry and we need to reinvent ourselves in how we deliver health and not just health care we see health as the investments as the economic driver of the future it makes people happy uh, but we can no longer just look at healthcare in the way it's traditionally being delivered. So we talk about uh, a concept called the health continuum, where you can see what does ha have to happen to keep healthy people healthy. What can you do to prevent disease to happen or to, uh, to aggravate? And how can you do diagnostics that's first time right? How can you do treatment that is first time right, therefore taking the waste out of the system? And how can you help people to live with chronic disease in an acceptable manner while keeping a good life? Right? Probably outside of the four walls of the hospitals, but in the comfort of their own community and home. Um, big data and the, and, and the fourth industrialization uh, give us huge tools to do that. I think it is very exciting provided that we also allow ourselves to reinvent how we engage with patients, with consumers. And uh, we feel that um, consumers will have to take more accountability of their own health. And data will play a big role in that. By providing a closed loop data em uh, environment where, where consumers are given feedback on their health, where they can measure, monitor and motivate to take lifestyle changes, we think that we can change the paradigm. Now, this is often referred to as population health and big data. Um, but we need to be cautious because population health, when it is only about analytics, is not a solution. In the end, we need to touch people's lives. And that's where every consumer is an individual and every doctor will have an individual relationship with the patient. Um, and in our view, population health will have to evolve towards impacting people's lives and uh, enabling them to stay healthy, uh, to do preventative care, uh, to be diagnosed first time right, to have treatment that is hopefully minimally invasive, first time right, and allows you to go back to your community and support you to live with chronic disease. So I, uh, I believe that um, the internet, big data, sensor technology, uh, it will be able to connect care providers and consumers in a new way, uh, giving consumers more accountability of their health, changing the economics. Um, I'm very hopeful that that's possible, but we also need to be realistic that there are quite a few hurdles to overcome. Money streams may have to be redirected to new ways of extending care. Incentives may maybe have to be changed so that we all act in an outcome-based economic model where we only are rewarded if actually lives are improved and patients do recover. Um, so I, I envisage the need for a collaboration between governments, insurance, care providers, industry, finance, uh, so that we reinvent over the next, let's say, five years, maybe 10, how care is delivered. Uh, and the health continuum, I think, will give us a good framework uh, to do so. Thank you, Franz. Uh, Omar, let me, let me jump to you directly from there. I sense a, let's say, cautious optimism from Franz, and there's, there's work to be done. Do you share that, that sense? What's your perspective uh, from Medtronic? Well, let me actually start with where Franz finished, in the sense that, um, you know, th there has to be a real realization between all parties that we're all on the same team. And uh, I think, uh, you know, both RF and uh, Franz mentioned the, the need for collaboration. And, and for that, we need joint accountability for results and get rewarded for those results. And anything short of that, uh, first creates mistrust, and second, potentially creates waste because you're building up uh, things that are not connected properly and, and efficiency is not built in. 
so so that that's that's important. Uh, the other thing that I'd say is that as you try to approach um, this um, problem of both health, as is defined, and healthcare in emerging markets, uh, an alignment of structure. You know, the, 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 we look at three things that are essential. One is awareness, awareness amongst patients, uh, awareness amongst physicians. Uh, the second is training of physicians at different levels, all the way up the, re the referral chain to the actual treatment and post-acute care. And the third is building of infrastructure. And the problem is so big in the sense that the geographies are so massive and there's so many people involved at different levels of the economic pyramid that it's important to focus geographically in certain areas and build out all of those pieces, the awareness, the training, the infrastructure, so that you can have maximum impact on a population. Otherwise, you might build all of these, but you, you just don't have the time to cover everybody, and so you're expecting to see a result like decades later because until then, all the infrastructure is not complete. And so by doing it in geographic pockets uh, and then scaling it, I think is an approach that uh, we would encourage uh, you know, governments to, to, um, to kind of adopt, uh, but also uh, you know, other, other uh, partners that we may have. The, the final point I'll make is the connection between um, health and healthcare, if you like, in, in Arno's definition of health and healthcare. Although we fundamentally believe that uh, the interface with the healthcare system uh, uh, for a healthy person versus a person who's already been diagnosed is fundamentally different. The expectations of a healthy person is not to fall ill. The expectations of a person who's already ill is to get better. And so the interface is different, the expectations are different. However, there is uh, something that, that, that is somewhat in common, which is prevention. The difference being for a healthy person is primary prevention, for a sick person, it's in fact secondary prevention, in that you do the treatment and then you don't want them to get ill. But the way you approach them is obviously different because in one case you know the condition, the other case you're trying to prevent any condition. However, you know, there's a lot of money, uh, short-term benefit to be had by addressing sick people today because you're saving immediate cost. Uh, and by funding out post-acute care home care, social understanding, which you may have commonality in both types of prevention, one can perhaps um, you know, enhance the investments in primary prevention. So it's important to know the distinction and it's um, because they are different, but it's also important to understand where there are commonalities and how do you then utilize that commonality to, to drive better efficiency in delivering care for all in whatever state they're in. Thank you, Omar. Mark, you've been listening uh, to uh, two or three gentlemen from the private sector. You're representing uh, the largest philanthropic uh, organization uh, with the Bill and Gates Foundation, uh, 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 Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. What's your perspective uh, from, from your sector? Um, what are the key steps to, to, to face this global challenge of health? And, yeah. uh, and where do you agree and disagree, especially with your, with your speakers here? Well, I think from our perspective, I mean, you, you began by mentioning some of the great initiatives that have been launched here at, at, at WEF in previous years, um, which include the Gavi and, and the Global Fund to Fight HIV, TB, and, and Malaria, both of which we were very involved in at the inception. And I think those have proven kind of models of where grand challenges can come together and incentivize the industry, but they're more on the production and provision side uh, of things in terms of providing the vaccines, uh, getting them out into, into the field and so on. What uh, we've been talking about here on the panel and what makes us so excited to be a partner with everyone here on the Abrage Growth Markets Health Fund is the potential for really uh, Revolutionizing may be a little strong, but that's certainly our, our hope in the medium term of how we look at some of the service provision going on in many of these markets and the ways you can leverage productively the private sector to markets that would include poor people in urban markets, uh, be financially sustainable, and really have a ripple effect within those markets in terms of uh, quality indicators, impact, uh, strengthening the sort of human resource uh, systems ar around healthcare, and so uh, I think what you've heard from my fellow panelists here about 
you the very specific and real opportunities we have in the space right now that we're actually acting upon, uh, as with uh, Arif's example in, in India. And our hope is that this is both a really strong end in itself that will improve both quality and quantity and availability of healthcare in these markets, but something that will really show the potential for how these markets can spread into where there is really a massively growing demand in these urban centers uh, across Africa and Asia right now. So we're very optimistic about where this is headed. Thank you, Mark. And before I open the floor for questions, Omar, you briefly touched on it. Uh, uh, we have about 40, 50 heads of state here uh, coming to Davos and about 300 ministers. Now, I imagine I'm, I'm the good fairy and you have a wish to the public sector to support facing that, that, that global challenge. What would that be? Well, the first thing is to really buy into the theme that we talked about that, you know, believe that we are all on the same team. I, I think, frankly, uh, there has to be trust between the private and the public sector. And, uh, and that we're all trying to, to achieve the same purpose of providing better care at a lower cost uh, to more people. So I think that, uh, that's a starting point. And the, the second thing that I would say is, uh, just repeating what I said earlier, is that, is that focus on pockets and complete the chain rather than try to build out for everything. Because I think that that's just takes too long before you see any results. Thank you. Ari, from the financing angle, what's, what's your wish list there? So, you know, what I do have to say is that I often see governments um, going down a, a route or a path that the private sector often finds incomprehensible. And we can't work out quite why they're doing something. But in healthcare, I have to say that I feel mm -hmm. governments around the world are very focused on um, making a difference, coming together, and seeing and looking always for the innovative solution. And I think uh, what we have certainly experienced in this fund, the, the Abraj Global Health Fund that we are putting together, is that not only has the private sector taken the lead and the initiative in providing middle, middle income solutions in urban environments that can actually trickle down and trickle up, and different aspects of the private sector, as you see on this panel, but we also have received a lot of support from development finance institutions uh, across the United States and Europe. So that coming together is actually telling me that governments are alert, are awake, and are instructing their financial institutions and arms to work with the private sector to come up with solutions. I'm very optimistic that sooner rather than later, and you know, Franz sort of put it in the context of a five to 10 year uh, horizon as part of his continuum. And I actually feel that the 10 years that this fund will be in place should have uh, outcomes that are going to be quite radical across uh, Africa and the subcontinent. Very good, thank you. Franz, you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, um, I think we need to make a distinction between uh, developing markets and mature markets uh, as to what we ask those ministers and heads of states. Uh, I think for mature markets, uh, we really need to, to tear down the silos between uh, sources of funding, policy, and pr care, provi uh, care provisioning, and redistribute on how we connect with uh, patients and consumers on, uh, on managing their, uh, their health, uh, because there is enough money overall. It's just not, mm. it's still extended on a volume basis. Uh, and I think if we together take the waste out, then it should be sufficient to get people access and a, and a better uh, healthy uh, life. For the uh, emerging markets, it's, it's more challenging. Uh, there, uh, again, we should collaborate, um, but we need also to take the fragmentation out. Part of the urbanization challenge is because healthcare is only available in urban areas. Um, and what we have seen also in the Ebola crisis is the lack of infrastructure uh, is, is a problem uh, when it comes to uh, making the community uh, healthy. And um, so the vaccination programs are great, but if augmented with a rural uh, health infrastructure, um, such as Abraz also uh, uh, is, uh, is keen and sees as a viable business model. And what we have pioneered, among others, in Kenya was community life centers, where you actually create an economically viable model for a community with clean energy, uh, with clean water, um, and a doctor and a nurse, and the education system connected to a nearby city, you start creating a viable community 
uh, where that, uh, that attracts economic life and improves the health. So you, you need to be contextual and different solutions for different areas. And um, as, as many panelists said, collaboration is the key. Um, and that will get to breakthroughs. Hmm. So thank you, Franz. It's very easy for me to ask what, what the wish list is. You will be the one who will have to work on the multi-stakeholder effort there. So uh, you, have, uh, you have the chance to. Yeah, I mean, the wish list is very clear. It's to work with partners, uh, as it was discussed in the, in the, in the, in the panel today. Uh, I, I, I would like to uh, uh, reflect on what Omar, you were suggesting before. Uh, there is, in a way, uh, a massive amount of money being spent, uh, seven, eight, nine trillion maybe, France would probably write, being spent globally on health care. Uh, and uh, this is an area where, unfortunately, the incentives exist. They are simply flawed. Uh, they are volume-based, and that's what we need to address as part of our industry agenda. Now, the global challenge, which is about health, this is an area where incentives simply don't exist. This is where public-private cooperation need to happen. Because frankly speaking, if, if, you, ask, if you ask anyone, uh, where are the incentives to create vaccines for the next pathogen outbreak? Okay? Uh, what are the incentives to uh, actually uh, keep uh, populations healthy in the first place or help people uh, manage the lifestyle to prevent diabetes? Well, do they invent the, 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 the primary care physician is not making a penny for prevention. So what, what are those incentives? And I think that's where the global challenge will absolutely focus. Those incentives, realigning incentives in public-private collaboration so that health can be addressed in the first place. Thank you, Arnaud. And mindful of the time, we might have uh, time for one or two questions. Can I see a show of hands? And if you could state your name and uh, organization for the sake of our online audience. Sure. Uh, my name is David Sirota with International Business Times. This is to the whole panel. Um, there's a debate going on in the United States right now about um, different kinds of healthcare delivery systems, uh, whether it should stick with the president's uh, Obamacare, so-called Obamacare, or a single-payer system. I'm just curious, as you look at both the United States and other, um, other countries, um, which kinds of systems do you believe work best? Should the United States be thinking about a single-payer system? Should other countries be thinking about a single-payer system? Or should they be thinking about a different model? Thank you, David. I can take a crack at that, uh, and again, without getting too opinionated about the subject. The, the point that I'll make is that uh, you know, the term single-payer is a bit of a red herring. I think the real issue in healthcare is the move, as, as Arno pointed out, is a successful move from fee-for-service to, to, to value-based. And you know, the UK is, so to speak, a single-payer system, but they're a fee-per-service system. And, and I think there's inefficiencies in that care delivery. And so I think the, the nature of the payment and who holds it, whether it's uh, one entity or divided into several entities, is really a secondary point. And you know, the politicians can decide how they want to do that. But the, the, the usage of how a payer actually provides the funding is what's important. And that has to move towards a value-based system. If it moves towards a value-based system, you're going to save cost. And, uh, and improve outcomes. That's the whole point. And you know, depending on the nature of the country and its politics, you can decide how you do it, but that's the important point. The, the most successful countries in the world uh, simultaneously work on a supply and a demand side, yes. right? Uh, supply side, avoiding the wrong incentives or the perverse incentives that makes it volume-based. Um, rather incentives to take waste out and pr come to better outcomes, but also the demand side. And this is where earlier we spoke about, you know, keeping healthy people healthy, uh, uh, doing early prevention, doing population health, um, providing feedback to consumers on what their lifestyle may have as consequences. And, uh, and the, the, the Internet of Things is going to make that possible. Uh, and we often use the, the e expression, you know, you measure, uh, you manage and you motivate, uh, and if you do that on a constant basis, nobody wants to get sick, right? So it is having the right dialogue with consumers that, and that will influence the demand side, right? So we need to do both simultaneously, uh, and it doesn't have to do with a single payer system or not. It has to do with optimizing the ecosystem together uh, and tweak it a bit. And I think accountable care is certainly part of it. Uh, but also accountable care can exist in many forms. 
Thank you. I think the, the question is also a developed markets luxury. Uh, because when you look across the markets that we're talking about in global growth markets, in the so-called emerging markets, you have to remember that we're even talking about putting in place healthcare where it doesn't exist. So the question of paying for it is a much more of a secondary down the road issue. So for example, when you take Lagos or you take uh, Karachi or Calcutta, you would be amazed at the fact that even the baseline of proper healthcare does not exist. So our job is actually to put that in place, to put in the tertiary care, to put in uh, a network uh, of an ecosystem that can reflect the ability to pay. And then we'll talk about the issues of how to pay. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have more questions? Yes, for the lady in the front here, please. Microphone is coming. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Harriet. I work for Channels Television, Lagos, Nigeria. My question is for you, Arif. You talked about using private equity or capital to fund the health care. Sorry, could you repeat that? You talked about using private capital and equity to fund um, health care providers. But in a situation where we see global stock markets uh, plummeting, even in Nigeria, our stock market has uh, fallen in the last uh, uh, 10 days to about about by about two trillion naira. So we're looking at such um, such a way of raising capital for the healthcare providers. What would you say is the most practical way to do it? So I think um, I won't call it a luxury, but certainly a comfort that we have is that we have committed capital in place to invest in places like Lagos, where we're very active in developing uh, the model that we are talking about right now. The other thing that you have to remember is partnership capital of the nature that private equity represents in what I call PE 3.0 um, is very much a long-term provision of capital. So we're not that affected by fluctuations in the stock market. We're not that affected by immediate sentiment of negativity for us. The reality is that we will be investing now and it will be a five and 10 year cycle that will reap that we will reap our rewards, not today or tomorrow, reflected in higher valuations, but over a continuum, as Fran says, over a period of time where the fact that we put these services in play and the fact that we enable provision of healthcare to reach people who don't currently have it, the rewards are actually financial and otherwise uh, of a longer term nature. So I'm not uncomfortable about what's happening in the world today. If anything, the real estate on which we'll build hospitals will become cheaper. Thank you very much. I, I was just moments ago the, the good ferry. Now I have to be the bad cop and, uh, and uh, close this press conference because we're already running over time. But it's, it's obvious that this is a very important discussion and, uh, and many questions uh, to, be, to be worked on. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for joining the live stream. And, uh, and a particular thank you uh, to, to my whole panel. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.